Okay, so welcome everyone and thank you for coming to this evening's author talk with the fabulous Essex author, Sid Moore. Before becoming an author, Sid worked extensively in the publishing industry and also presented Channel 4's book programme, Pulp. Her book, The Twelve Strange Days of Christmas, which is excellent, I've recently read that, was shortlisted for the prestigious Dagger Award by the Crime Writers Association. And at the end of the event today, Sid will be gifting a signed copy of it to one of you. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, Sid. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's, it's a delight. Um, mm. One of the questions we asked um, the audience members when they joined this evening um, was about the exhibition this talk, talk is part of. So Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights is the exhibition theme. And I asked our audience when they joined the webinar, do you agree that the fight for women's rights is still unfinished? So I'm just going to pop up to share the results of that with you all. And 96% of you said yes, and 4% of you said no. Sid, what's your take on that? What do you think? Um, I'm just wondering if the no's are accidents. Because <laughs> I think it's, um, to me, it's just very, very obvious that the, um, the fight is, still ongoing you might have seen that this week we had with the Essex Girls Liberation Front we managed to take the, the one of the definitions of the stereotype out of one of the dictionaries but there's still loads in there um and also I kind of um I did a, I, I keep doing uh interviews and chairing debates of, about this subject and I just, if I may, I'm just going to read you some statistics that I came up with last year, um, which, which are about political representation and women around the world. So, um, so these are a year out of date, but I really don't think they're going to change that much considering the last year as well. Uh, one in four parliamentarians worldwide is a woman. Fewer than one in five government ministers are female. Uh, the number of female heads of state or government is set to decline this year from 15 to uh, 215 from 17. The UK currently ranks 41st in the world for women's representation in Parliament. So 32% of all MPs are women. Um, top, by the way, is Rwanda which has got 61.3%. Bottom is Qatar, Micronesia, Papua New Guinea, and Yemen, who have got zero. Um, so you, uh, you think, Sid, that we, we still have, obviously from the stats you're talking about, quite a way to go still for women's rights. Yes, definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, you know, it's before we even start going into witch hunts and uh, persecution, um, you know there are there are lots and lots of um, inequalities in this country. We know that women have been harder hit as well by the coronavirus. Um, you know, just look at the cabinet at the moment. Who's in the cabinet at the moment? Who's the prime minister? Um, you know, you, it's just very. I think it's very very visible at the moment that you can see that there isn't equality in terms of women at the top. Certainly. There's still a massive pay gap as well. There's still, a, I mean, obviously that's one of the, because of the theme of this exhibition, which is part of the British Library, as they said, you've still got those, those fights that are still ongoing. Now, the, the second question I asked people when they joined was around witch hunts and mm. do they think it's a thing of the past? Now, 19% of you said yes, and 81 of you 81% of you said no, which I was actually surprised about. I thought it would be, it would be different, actually. I thought yeah. that people would say differently. So obviously, Sid, you're, you're the UK ambassador of a Danish charity that helps 
um, which children? And so what are your thoughts on this? Would yeah. you like to share with people about this charity and what is going on yeah. in modern day uh, now? So um, Dindyel, and I think that is how you pronounce it. Uh, I noticed you avoided that. Well, I that did. Means. I thought I'm going to get it wrong. Maybe it said no. <laughs> but, I, you know, I um, can say I'm probably going to be corrected on that. But, um, they are um, uh, yeah, a Danish charity who um, basically run an orphanage in Nigeria because um, in Nigeria, all around the world, there are witch hunts going on. Um, the sort of witches tend to be different people. Of course, they are usually, on the whole, older women. But in Nigeria, children are, are identified as witches, and um, it's 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 like a, a pandemic. Well, no, not pandemic. It's like an epidemic at the moment over there. Um, and so, what they do is they have just created one orphanage, um, just one, um, which. Uh, Basically, if you can sort of donate to them, they are trying to expand it at the moment, but you can donate per month, two pounds. It will help feed those children, um, children try and rehabilitate them as well, help them with education and with therapy as well, because a lot of them um, have been attacked by their families. They've been identified as witches. Quite often children are put outside, thrown out of the house, chained up to trees, uh, chained into yards, because they're identified as being a witch and having caused um, something terrible, uh, disease, famine, death, to a member of the family or to that village. So they are identified as the problem. Um, and the theory is that if the, the witch goes away, then the problem obviously will resolve itself. So um, what Dinyal do, they are trying to collect some of these children just in one pound in Nigeria. Um, and take them away and look after them. But it is, it is it's a huge problem. And there is also um, an a information network uh, called WHRIN, um, which is run by Gary Fox, and they provide information about human rights abuses with, um, with regards to belief in witchcraft, um, spirit possession as well, and juju. Um, and there are, you know, unfortunately, there are cases everywhere at the moment, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, South Africa, Congo, Kenya, Nepal, India, uh, and obviously Nigeria I've spoken about, but uh, you know, as well, um, they also uh, happen in the UK. Um, children are being persecuted because of witchcraft belief here. Um, in Europe, uh, a lot of women um, are trafficked, sex trafficked as well. And this is because of um, something called the oath. So they are um, trafficked into um, sex slavery, basically because they go through this oath where they are bonded to their master. And then they have to go, once they go through um, and get trafficked over to a European country, they often do not leave the, um, their, ma their master because they think the master has bonded them and that master has through this ritual that they go through ha has a linked to their soul and their family so they often never leave them uh, but anyway you know I don't it's, want to depress it's, everyone but, no, but it's, it's, it's really shocking in this modern day that all of yeah. this is still going on like where there is so much not just with women's rights like the theme of the exhibition but mm. there is so much unfinished business there is so many yes. more things that we need to address as a society yes. to improve things for women for um, people of color for children for people persecuted mm. as witches it's it seems quite endless sometimes um yeah. but I, I mean obviously over the years we have when you said about not not being too depressing I don't think it is I think people need to know right. that things are, are going on but then on the other side we have over the years made a lot of progress so yeah. you know yeah. I guess it shows that even when things are they the way they are now it doesn't mean that in 10 20 30 however many years we're not going to keep moving forward with that and mm. addressing these issues by doing things like this and talking about them and airing them yeah, absolutely. Um, and that is definitely, I mean, this is one of the things I do when we're not suffering from a pandemic is um, 
I do uh, talks with Christy Brimelo, who was the UN lead for, um, lead for the legal bar on human rights. And she is also an expert in children's rights. Um, and so we talk about, well, we talk about the history of witchcraft and witchcraft persecution. And Kirsty talks about the evolution of um, the children's rights acts and also how to spot if you um, if a child is being um, abused due to witchcraft related belief as well um, and she sort of identifies a lot of cases that people think are child abuse are actually down to uh, belief in harmful practice due to belief in witchcraft that's how the UN puts it um, so the Christy Bamu and Victoria Klimbia, you know, these were all children who were harmed because of belief in witchcraft. And yeah, it, it is, it's really important that we are all aware that this is going on, you know, it's going on in Leytonstone at the moment. It's going on very, very close to us in major cities all around the world, um, all around the, the UK. Um, and it is good to be aware. It is good to be aware of it and to spot it and to, um, let people know about it and call it out when you can see it it's happening if it is happening definitely and I was, I was just wondering Sid would this be a, a perfect moment to read the prologue for your book Witch Hunt hmm. um obviously the Essex yeah. Museum books yeah well actually this is not one of the Essex books. oh it's not is it my no. mistake this is um which also has got do not remove Sid's reading copy but this is yeah so this is from my second novel Witch Hunt and so this is it's it's quite distressing I think so I don't know I think if anybody gets distressed maybe uh I don't know you, you could mute you could mute you could mute it for a moment yeah um, mute it, mute but it it's I mean it's, it's touching again on those topics that, as we've said are important to air that it's important yeah to so talk this, about. this is witch hunt is sort of um the the yeah so it's my second novel my first one was the drowning pool and it was about the legend of a local woman called sarah moore um and when i started researching her i put essex witches into google you know, very academic um and uh it didn't bring up google didn't bring up any results about sarah moore but it did bring up a statistic which was that between 1560 and 1680 in Hartford, Surrey and Suffolk. The total number of indictments for witchcraft were, were was 185. Um, the same time for Essex on its own, the total number of indictments for witchcraft was 503. So Essex had loads more um, than any other local sort of home county. Uh, lots of different reasons for this and different ideas for it, um, which I'm not going to go into at the moment. Um, but when I was looking, I was very shocked by that because I didn't really realise at that time that Essex had had so many um, trials, witch trials. And so I started digging into, and I was very shocked because I'd heard of Pendle. I'd heard about, you know, Pendle, there were 12 people killed or executed. In Salem, there were 19 over 19 months, but just on one day in 1645, on July the 29th in Chelmsford, uh, 29 women were tried and 19 were hanged. Um, and I was very shocked to, to know, um, as a feminist and a woman who's been brought up in Essex, I was really shocked that I didn't know more about this. So I started digging down and I, I found out that um, a lot of these indictments were due to Matthew Hopkins, um, who was the self-appointed witchfinder general, who also went up to Suffolk, of course. Um, and so, and I sort of looked at him and I started investigating what he did, why he did it, how he did it. And the other thing I wanted to do in this book was to to try and um, reclaim some of the women's stories because we know Matthew Hopkins, we know his name, but we don't know the names of the women who 
he killed basically and, and I, I now think that's amazing that you did that as well Sid because you're right sometimes it's the notorious person that commits these yeah. crimes that everybody knows but the victims are just almost silent and unknown yeah and a lot of them we don't know what their names are because if they died in some of the many tests that he put them through to see if they were witches then they wouldn't have been recorded. It's only if they actually made it all the way through to trial that their names would have been recorded. You know, they were peasant class women, so they couldn't read or write. Um, so they, they have just slipped through the fingers of history. We don't know who those people are, who those women are, but we do know some of them who did go to trial. And I was really struck by the story of Rebecca West and, she was sent to prison with um, her mother and Elizabeth Clark, who was an 80 year old woman. And actually, if you look at her, um, if you look at her um, testimony, which is in a pamphlet and on the diseases records, then it, it does sound like she's got dementia. She was disabled. She had one leg and she accused Anne West and her mother and lots of other women of being witches as well. But this was under torture, under duress. Anyhow, they all ended up in um, Colchester Castle prison in the dungeon. And one day, um, Matthew Hopkins came up and he took Rebecca out of the dungeon and had an interview with her. And no one knows what happened, but we do know that she, at the end of the interview, she turned King's counsel. And so she testified against her mother and her friends and Elizabeth. And because of her testimony, Hopkins was able to bring the death and um, what really struck me about this was that, you know, in one way it's, 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 it's awful because he was then became emboldened and then went off around the rest of Essex and up the East Coast finding more witches. Um, but at the same time, Rebecca West was 14. So she was just a child, you know. The history's got a very mixed view of her. Some people think that she was a, you know, a harlot um, who was out for herself. But I just think you've got to remember how old she was. How old? Are you still with us, there, Sid? Anyhow, Sorry, you went. You went for a moment. Oh, did I? Sorry. It's all I was good. Just, I was just saying I'm going to get on with the prologue now. Okay. So, are you ready? Go for it. Oh. Uh, and so I came here. I have put a, put on my cap and wrapped a shawl over too. They know, so none may see me, though I see all. And I see them bound and tethered in a pen like sheep. Then there are the others, the eager spectators. So many clustered before me, edging their way forwards, cranning to get a good view that I can only catch glimpses through the space between my neighbor's shoulders. On their faces, some have smiles. The girl beside me, only two or three years younger than I, licks her lips and stands up upon her toes. Her father in starch lace and black pulls her back down and with a stare admonishes her excitement. The woman beside him has a face full of glory. Her eyes are wide in anticipation. In her hand, she has a knife and fingers it greedily. She will cut hair from the dead. On. A hush falls over the crowd as the first is helped up to the scaffold. You can see from the way she stumbles it is old Mother Clark. Her ancient face is creased with lines of age and knots of confusion. Two of the men assisting have taken an arm each to support her, for she cannot stand firm with but one leg. She staggers forward and clutches the man on her right to steady herself as the hangman pulls the noose over her head. A woman at the front near the gallows hurls something rotten. It hits Mother Clark on the chin and she looks about to throw some rebuke back, but before she can open her mouth comes the push. Her wizened frame drops and cracks as the noose does its work quickly, thank God, and she is turned off. Next it is Anne Leach, younger than Mother Clark. She wrestles with the hangman as much as she can with her hands bound. There is little way to fight, but she will not go without one. One of the throng, a man with a red beard and broad shoulders, goes her and calls, Witch, you will go to the devil now. Anne always had more spirit. She spits at him and calls out a curse. 
crowd stirs, excited by the show, laughing as the hangman roughly slips over the noose. Anne is angry and wild. She begins to bring down a curse on the hangman, but cannot finish. Dub from behind stops her words, yet it does not stop her life. And she fists and turns on the end of the line like a fish from the brook. Our man speaks to the man at his side and points up to the rope is coming apart. He calls for a ladder, but not in time for the rope to unravel and Anne falls with it to the ground, catching the side of the scaffold as she goes down. The crowd surges forward to watch, she is picked up and shown. To their delight, she has dashed out an eye and is carried back up to the third noose and hanged once more. A deep red drip from her face darkens her dress, but still the twitching on. The girl at the front runs forward to pull on her legs, but she is stopped by the broad-shouldered man. Above Anne, the hangman and his men throw up another drope. Elizabeth Clark is being taken down. I cannot see where they take her corpse. And then she is there on the scaffold. Her long black locks sway softly as she turns to the noose. I gasp as I see her watch Anne's feet jerking without rhythm, but she says nothing. She is solemn, silent, and hearing of the jeers of the crowd come to witness her end but I see her searching over the faces. For a moment, I think perhaps our eyes meet and I see in them a movement, a quick darting, a widening of the whites. Does she see me? I raise up my face and move back my shawl, bolder now, unconcerned by what the crowd may do if they recognize me. My confidence back suddenly and flinch as the noose comes down over her slender neck. Her, her mouth opens and I think she too is about to speak. But I cannot be sure because she has been pushed from the stool. The noose has strung tight, her neck snapped to an unnatural angle. The feet kick out and then are still. And I fall to my knees. Stick of oh God, have mercy, what have I done? I was. I found that really very moving. Actually, said um, yeah, it is cobbled together as well from a contemporary testimony. Well, 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 someone in the audience has um, messaged to say um, that it was. She found it deeply moving, and also that women's stories are so important. So that was Grace. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. sharing that. Yeah. Us, Grace, I completely agree. I was being again a bit choked up actually. Yeah, it's um, quite tough, but you know, this is this is what happened. And I, I don't think it serves us to ignore the past or, or sweep it under the carpet because it's just going to lead to more likelihood that these things will be repeated. Yes, we need to learn right. from our lessons in history. We need to understand what's taken place because if we don't, then we're, we're doomed really to repeat it if we don't have these conversations. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Lisa. Yeah. And um, one of um, Grace has also actually asked um, about your research process um, for your books and like how much time do you spend? Because obviously there's so much detail involved for each of your books. Yes, well, it, it's um, because of um, the way publishers work these days, it's getting less and less because <laughs> they want books more and more quickly. So. Um, the Drowning Pool, I probably researched for about seven years um, before it was published. Um, I could, and also I was working at the same time, so it took me quite a while to research and write that one. Witch Hunt, I think, took me about two years. And then um, The Strange Magic, probably a year. Strange Sight, probably six months. <laughs> you know, you can see a pattern here. Um, it just reduces, but I, I'm, I'm trying to write something else now. I don't think I'm allowed to say what it is. So you but have it, a book coming out in May next year? Yes, yes, that's actually all written. It was going to be published uh, this year in June, um, but that, uh, because of COVID, it's been pushed to next year. Uh, so that's written, and I am doing research at the moment for the following book, which I'm writing, and actually that's some of my plot here 
behind me. You've all of those yeah. little post-its to keep track. Yes, and a map of another fictional village that I've been, um, yeah, made up, basically. Well, um, actually, when you said about the village, um, Lynn asked, um, Leighton Stone, which area, well, you mentioned it, do you know which area is affected around witches and the person? Oh, what do you mean? Sorry, generally? Yeah, are you aware... Like of the area. Well, there's there's in Leytonstone there there are people who have got their own channels who are exercising witches. So yeah, that's in. Uh, there is a uh, have a look if you're in Leytonstone. There is um yeah have a look at the local channels and you will see adverts for people who are prepared to exercise children who they think are witches. Um. It's but yeah, shocking, isn't it? yes, yes. But I mean, it is, um, I suppose it is really shocking. Yeah, but it's a kind of, I suppose, because I became more aware of it uh, a couple of years ago when I went to a really brilliant conference at Lancaster University, which was about um, witchcraft and human rights around the world. And it was really shocking, but very eye-opening um yeah just we had a um a jesuit priest who's trying to work in Papua New Guinea um and who's having a very very difficult time there uh, there are a lot of women being killed in Papua New Guinea at the moment because of witchcraft belief and it, it didn't used to happen about 10 years ago it's been a very very quick um, escalation of witchcraft belief over there, but there are lots and lots. I mean, in fact, the the this year's conference was held in Papua New Guinea, to sort of highlight the the huge uh, human rights crisis that's going on at the moment there. But yes, there was loads of different things. There's lots of, um, I mean, I'm trying to think about it now. Like I said, there's lots of trafficking that's going on because of um, witchcraft belief. Sweden, Sweden has got a huge problem with that. We wouldn't necessarily associate that with Sweden, a very kind of um, you know, permissive liberal culture, but yeah, they, they have got it's, a It's problem. almost in these cultures, even though we, we think that, you know, maybe they're not going on, you've got that underbelly of some of the things that maybe most people just aren't aware is taking yeah. place. I mean, uh, you know, I think if you think about um, any any country that, experiences human trafficking uh which i think is probably every country in the world unfortunately um and there's going to be um instances of trafficking because of witchcraft belief and and there, you know, and there will just be instances of um witchcraft belief uh, persecution because of witchcraft witchcraft belief um that, that it, it exists in every country now and as i know we talked about earlier almost an excuse to persecute in a lot of places women it's yeah yeah i mean but also like, over here it does tend to be i mean the women are persecuted but um over here it, like i said it is children as well of both sexes um the but yes i mean india it's older women with dementia who are usually push this is again this is gross and really horrible but um they are usually um they uh, the community dig pits and then they put holes onto them and they would just push the women onto the poles that's that's how you get rid of a witch over there but um yeah Papua New Guinea yeah actually do you know what? I'm not going to talk about it anymore because it's too depressing it's out there and people can research it but I'm not going to go into it because and also you have to be careful when you talk about this kind of thing because it is really awful but there's almost sometimes a danger of going into like violence porn area do you know what I mean so you've got to be really respectful yeah and so I'm just not going to talk about that anymore if that's okay that's with fine. you Lisa. I mean, one of the things I was actually going to move on to is um obviously and someone's actually mentioned in the comments um, to offer you huge congratulations on the progress that you've made with the Essex Girl movement. Oh, um, thank you. Just fantastic and 
I thought, um, obviously, you, you do campaign against those negative stereotypes of the Essex girl and also co-created super strumps. I said it right this time. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, will you talk to us about that? Like, obviously, your inspiration around it and why you're so passionate about it. Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking to see if I've got one here, actually. Look, there's on. So that is a super strumps here. So this is, well, I've been writing about the Essex girl for, I don't know, about 20 years, actually, which is crazy, really. If you think about stereotypes, you know, it came up in the 1980s and, and here we are in 2020, still discussing it. Um, it's kind of lived on. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I think maybe because it's really has stereotypes going. It's very powerful and it's it's very good at smacking down bold women who kind of deviate from the norms of expected female behaviour. Um, so it is used quite a lot. And people always ask me about Towie as well. You know, well, what do you think of Towie? Do you think Towie are kind of perpetuating the stereotype? I think Essex is really diverse and that's the point we're trying to make you know not everybody um looks like it's into a little box we don't all fit into a exactly, little box anyway. exactly and so you know when I was doing um so I think I did these in about 2008 and I'd already been asked to write articles about the Essex girl because when I moved back to Essex um 2003 I think it was um, they, uh, I was really surprised because I took up a position lecturing at the local college and I was really surprised to find out that some of my students, the females, were going away and going to university interviews and the interviewer was going, looking at their address and saying, oh, you're an Essex girl, are you? And that kind of like puts them into a kind of bind because they either go, um, ah, yes, I am an Essex it's girl and that kind of like confirms the stereotype and of course the stereotype well the definition which we had removed today I'm just going to see if I've got my board yeah okay so this is the one we got rid of today um from the Oxford learners and this is Essex girl noun a name used especially in jokes to refer to a type of woman who is not intelligent dresses badly talks in a loud and ugly way and is very willing to have sex. There you go. So that's for all the foreign students to learn about England. And I'm just uh, like, it's fantastic that, um, as you said, it's you've campaigned and it's it's been removed now, as it should be. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. That's 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 a teaching tool to teach people about Britain. Yeah. Ugh. Why is it there? Why is it there? Anyway, go on. Thank goodness. Um, but we're sort of like a, a lot of the stuff that um, a lot of the, the the ideas that are that are projected onto the Essex girl, the kind of idea about scandal, moral impropriety, all of that, it's actually really eighties. It's you know the Essex girl came reared her blonde flossy head in the eighties, and the kind of moral perspective is really old fashioned. It's really eighties. And I was sort of talking to a local artist, Heidi Wigmore, about it. And I, we were sort of saying, well, you know, if you take away that kind of 80s moral knee jerk, then actually the Essex girl's got quite a lot going for her. She's confident. She's bold. She works hard like the boys. She plays hard like the boys. Is she promiscuous or is she sexually autonomous and liberated? And so we started looking at this, and so we designed the, uh, we came up with the card. So we had lots of, um, we decided that the Essex girl is really similar to lots of other regional stereotypes. And um, so in, in America- Great picture. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good for her. She's defiant. She's mouthy. She's a bit gobby. Good. And why not? You know, we need a bit of defiance, I think. So we yeah, yeah, she's like so the Essex girl is a bit like the Jersey girl in America. Um, and Essex is outside of London as Jersey is outside of New York, you know, and the capital tends to look down on those women in the same way. But she's a bit yeah, like but the, you know, I, I hadn't thought of that um comparison, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, and Jersey Shore, Jersey Shore is was the reality TV show that inspired Towie. 
as well. Um, but anyhow, we sort of said, you know, she's sexually liberated, she's fun loving. Um, so she has special powers and her special powers are glamour, uh, drinking capacity, nonchalance, humour, sociability. And her magical power is that she is invulnerable to cold, which we love. Um, we also decided to do this for loads and loads and loads of stereotypes. So we've got things like the battle axe, we're great brilliant Nora Batty type woman on the fantastic front. and like you really turned all those stereotypes on their head and yeah, gone yeah, turn them around and look at the positives within so she's assertive she has authority she has brute force and we've got 100 women in to rate them um on qualities of nurture strength independence resourcefulness, resourcefulness. so you can actually um play them like top trumps and it's a kind of tool to start talking about all the stereotypes that women have had thrown over them. Literally, we had this idea of a wow thinking, women of the world thinking. And on the way back from that thinking, I said, let's just see how many stereotypes we can come up with. So in an hour, I think we'd come up with over 300 stereotypes for women. We tried the same exercise. Uh, for men and I think in an hour we managed to get, scrape about 30 yeah. and they weren't particularly bad either you know if you think about Jack the Lad there's like an implicit oh well you know he's a little bit he's a bit cheeky yeah. quite a nice chap yeah he's got um, something but like with the women's stereotypes it's always a, a sort of hideous patriarchal judgment so like career woman career woman the idea is that she's either neglecting her family because for her career as a bad woman neglecting her family or she's got no family and no friends so she's subsuming herself into her career because she's lonely you know there's always some kind of judgment in there but you know our career woman can um, her special power is uh smashing glass ceilings <laughs> Oh, I love that. That's fantastic. And it's not, I mean, when you say about there's so few you're able to think of for men. Yeah. And yet, like you said, often, um, which is great that you did the cards because you're you're like flipping that stereotype about women yeah. when when they apply that same kind of stereotype to a man. Quite yeah. a lot of the time, it's become a good quality. Yeah. Um, like that man white van man he's got a van he's got assets he's mobile you know there's always something positive there or that's perceived as positive it's never it's never something like slag you know, it's really, yeah. you know it, the, the moral judgments that are involved I, I kind of just show you the the values of society at the moment i think definitely i mean it's like when you said about career woman mm -hmm. um so like the female well, you know, how the stereotype is addressed to a woman who has a strong career. Yeah. Well, if it's a man, it's often considered, oh, well, they're providing for their family. And yeah. it's someone this said, wonderful yeah. thing they're doing. This week, someone said to me, you know, when I was doing one of the interviews about the, the definition coming out, someone said to me, oh, how old are you? And I was like, I'm telling you, uh, and do you have children? And I thought, okay, so this is going to be Sid Moore, age, mother of X. And I thought, how many times do you hear Boris Johnson, age, father of God knows, you know, actually, who knows, but like five, but never pre pre preface a bloke, whatever they're doing. I think that's true. And like when you said about um, the Prime Minister, it reminded me that not that long ago when we had a female Prime Minister, they had yeah. a picture in the newspaper of her and I think it was Nicola Sturgeon and it was focusing on their legs. Oh, God. I thought um, you were going to say children, actually, because I know she, um, you know, that's Angela, what's her name? She was the other, let's, um, she criticised. Oh, yes, um, yes. Theresa May for not said she couldn't be a politician because she didn't have children and um again you know this uh, I think that is that just makes me think as just reminds me as well that we also have to remember that a lot of women are sexist 
as well you know yeah. well I mean we're still subjected to the, those same sort of it almost becomes an unconscious bias where we're all subjected to these stereotypes yes. and we get to a point where we don't necessarily even question it mm. we just start becoming part of the problem yeah 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 I think so um it, uh, you know it is unfortunate again this goes back to your question we you know where we still got that in society we haven't finished for me it feels like we are only just getting started with equality it really does well I, I just thought this is a good time to say that David who's watching has um, added his uh, messages to say congratulations Sid on the victory over the dictionary so we you, you know David thank you it's nice to have some some blokes getting involved and in, yeah and actually that is the other thing as well so loads of the blokes in Essex are completely behind us you know it isn't well, that's about gender in the definition. Blokes are, you know, blokes are products of women. <laughs> they've got mums, they've got sisters, they've got kids, you know. It's it's and um, we need men to help us fight this as well. You can't you can't do it, you can't achieve change on your own. In fact, one of the people who actually kicked this week's um uh media frenzy off was the uh, Times journalist Jack Melvin, who got <laughs> me to start talking about it you know he published the the article which got picked up everywhere thank thank you Jack as well um but it was really supportive about what we're doing so yeah it's 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 got to be everybody moving in the right direction thank you David Definitely. by the way and I, and I think that's really important as you said to acknowledge that as what you know it's not just women looking to um address these stereotypes and these um restrictions that we need to like break through men are joining it as well i mean like my husband yeah. works for union so he's very passionate about all things equality and works very hard to address these kind of issues and it's it's really good to see that crossover that you know you as you say you might have women that um may say things or behave in a bizarrely sexist way towards other women mm. but at the same breath we've got men that are standing up for women's rights mm. and that's I think that's just fantastic to see that they as you say there are a lot of people on both sides that are, are you know coming to this fight to make the changes mm. yeah absolutely. Um, one of the audience members said about learning the stereotypes as we grow up uh, yeah. um it takes age and time to realise that they are incorrect. That is Absolutely. very true. Yeah, it is. And, and, and that's also why it's really important to get them out of like the dictionaries, especially dictionaries that children use. All stereotypes, really, out of the dictionaries. Um, but we also know that just removing them from the dictionary doesn't stop the stereotype being there. You know, it's about perception. We'd be stupid not to realise that. But we obviously... We're doing lots of things about the uh, with the exhibition where we've got lots of very strong women um, who are ordinary women but doing amazing things who all defy the stereotype. We were wearing our t-shirts, which are um, they say this is what an Essex girl looks like. And that's what the exhibition is as well. But we're doing lots of different things. We're trying to get a make a, a banner at the moment for the Essex Girls Liberation Fund, but we're changing our name from Essex Girl. To Essex girl, like G R R. Oh, I like that, like a girl. Yeah, like the riot girl, because I used to be a riot girl. Bit of feist uh, going on, bit of feistiness. Yeah, but that's uh, what I think that Essex girls are like now. They are feisty because they've had to put up with dealing with the stereotype all these years. Yeah, I mean, when I mean, I was origi originally was born in Lancashire, but as, as I met you, Sid, several years ago in Essex. So I spent a lot of years um, living in Essex as well. And I think, you know, combined the northern northern side is also quite feisty as well as the yeah. Essex side. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting combination, I think. Um, yeah. One of one of the audience members has also asked those super stromps cards, mm. like, can we get hold of them? Okay. How can someone get a copy? Do you know? Well, we oh, blimey. I'll tell you what, um, if, you, if you contact me on Twitter, I might be able to find some. But we did have a website. I don't know if it's still working. It's been quite, I think we started doing this in 2008. It stopped running down. But if you get in contact with me through Twitter, I'll see if I can sort something out. 
Oh, you're a star. Thanks ever so much, Sid. I mean, we've actually only got 10 minutes left. So it's oh, blimey, that went quickly. Okay. It whizzed by. It did last time we talked, Sid. I think I, I could have spent all afternoon <laughs> just yeah. chatting to you. Um, it was wonderful. I know that we wanted to um, get a, a reading oh. from the 12 oh. strange days of Christmas. Yeah. Enjoy it. Um, and I think... Um, and I've got one to give away as well, too. Oh, you're a star. Agnes uh, has just yeah. also asked, where can they get the T-shirts from? Ah, yes. So if you go onto the Essex Girls Liberation Front on Facebook and message, um, Joe, who is Joe Frigia, will help sort one out for you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sid. Pleasure. Shall I show you? Oh, no, I don't worry. I was going to go and get one, but it's fine. Oh, gosh, no. Do we? Shall I show you? Yeah, that'd be fabulous. Right, they are really good. Fantastic. I'm just seeing there's a great picture in the background of Sid's room there that looks quite spooky, which um, will be appropriate. As Sid, when she comes back, will be um, reading one of those, a collection of short stories, um, The Twelve Strange Days of Christmas, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Several parts ended quite shockingly, so I really recommend it. What a fab t-shirt. And we've got them in black as well, and tight or baggy. So, and that is a really, look, you can't really see it, but it's very, very uh, bright pink there. I can't remember how much they are. I think they might be 15, maybe. But anyway, right. Should I get on with the reading then? Sorry, I'm taking no, over. you're time. fabulous. You're always <laughs> fabulous, Sid. <laughs> so, do, do, have you said anything about this one? Um, I haven't said anything about the story, but when you popped out of the room, I was just letting the audience know that I'd read it. It's really excellent. I was quite uh, shocked by you. some of the endings and was like... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I was trying to think that the house on Savage Lane was probably my favourite. Mm. Oh, was it? Okay. It's quite sinister, isn't it? Very sinister, um, yeah. And yeah. I was just like, at the end, like, oh, my God. I know. So um, Even my really good friends, like, read this and go, God, I forgot that you were weird. <laughs> books. Um, but th this one is not weird or nasty this one is actually probably the softest one in the book no way i thought it was really lovely okay well this is quite a nice little one to finish on as we go up to christmas isn't it okay so <clears throat> oh yeah and i'd say the the rest of them what I kind of compare them to is like Tales of the Unexpected vibe, really. But anyway, snowy, here we go. This was the third white Christmas that Nora had spent alone in Addersbrook. Well, not alone, just without the company of fellow Homo sapiens. Not that she minded. Her home was warm and she was well loved and well cared for by her family of doting felines. Her own clan of humans have died off years since, sort of. She had a nephew, Colin, somewhere in Florida, who wrote to her twice a year, once on her birthday and once at Christmas. But they were boastful letters packed with photos of broad, rosy children who got fatter by the year and infinitely less interesting. He was convinced Colin paid her his juice to enjoy his steak in any request she might leave when she finally walked off this mortal coil, though she had no plan to do just yet. Nora was quite comfortable in the two parts of the house that she tended to frequent these days, the kitchen and the sitting room, with infrequent visits to the cloakroom across the hall. She'd given up bathing and the cats didn't mind, so she only used the bathroom for essential ablutions when absolutely necessary. A chamber pot under the, bed, under the bed was useful in this regard. Putting aside the remains of the microwave Christmas pud, she shuffled to her favourite seat, by backed armchair next to the Calagas heater, had a view out of the French windows onto the long lawn, the summer house, and beyond that, the orchard with the pear tree, plums and cobnuts. It was a splendid view that she had enjoyed for decades, at first with her husband, David, then, after him, with a succession of feline friends and acquaintances. Her first was Sooty, a rather unoriginal name, it was true, but she had never anticipated having a pet, at least a cat, 
he had thought them rather cruel beasts, aloof and haughty and cold, too independent by far and fickle with their affections. Much, she thought, herself. Perhaps that is why she had let Sooty into her heart so quickly. So much of the cat's nature seemed to mirror her own. In the end, she had been, it was true to say, utterly overwhelmed by the cat's existence. His gifts of a partridge, several mice and a vole. Finally, she had found that she was flattered by the fact that the king had chosen her. But who was she? Nora Davenport was just a little widow, old, with as wrinkled dugs as Tiresias and baggy at the seams, like another cat that had delighted children a long time ago. Not someone any right-minded feline might call for company. But then she had begun to realise these cats weren't just your run of the run of the mill furry friends. These cats were discerning. It had taken a few months to work Sooty out, but eventually it was Mozart that had given Nora the clue. The marriage of Figaro, to be precise. For it had been her sister's favourite. Black-haired, dark-eyed Lydia had always loved it so. It was on the anniversary of Lydia's birthday that the penny finally dropped. In the evening, Nora had got out 78 to honour her sister in a fashion. She had fixed herself a G&T, settled into her chair, and not noticed the cat staring in rapture at the old gramophone. Not at first. Not until she had flipped the side. Finally, when the needle clicked off, she watched in amazement as Sooty flipped her tail and slinked into the garden not remotely interested in anything else. A few weeks later, Snowy had trailed Sooty in through the door. Although, let's be straight, this was in fact Snowy the first. But there were many that were to follow. A regal puss with pink eyes and a tail that was brown at the tip. He recognised soon enough the spirit of her husband was in him. Snowy liked to play Scrabble, not with actual words as David had done, but in cat form now, he preferred to pour and play with the pieces, and that was enough for both of them. After Snowy came Tabby, her mother, with an appetite for game, mostly of the pigeon variety, all slanty eyes and affection, Tabby would purr on her lap and sleep on her pillow, her tail stroking Nora's thinning hair, just as her mother had done years before. Ginger was a Canadian airman she had met during the war, wild, picky and mischievous, He'd had a thing for the Andrews sisters, which post-mortem expressed itself in a preference for choosy cat food and an insistence that she didn't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but him. There followed a steady, a steady stream. Grey boy, an English teacher for whom she held great affection. Stocks, a black cat with white legs so very like her departed cousin Oliver. Raj, her friendly neighbour who'd got run over the previous year. He'd come back as a beautiful Siamese who was very, very affectionate. Albert, on the other side of the cottage, spent some time in the 80s. He'd been a gardener, now he was a cheeky stray. Fluffy was her father, with long whiskers and a penetrating glare. And she received regular visits from a whole array. Tiger, Misty, Edward, Suki, Oscar. Too many sometimes to come. All her friends and family returning. When Snowy the Fourth had died, she had been bereft and had forced herself into the night to give him a decent grave. Though no more snowies had come recently, she knew at some point he would return. Therefore, it was really no surprise when, after the Queen's speech and the pudding had gone down, she swiveled her eyes to the white shadow at the door. It meowed loudly, and Nora smiled. Angling her weary bones out of the chair, she opened the windows to let new Snowy in. Blonde and calm, with a gleam in his eyes, he stubbornly refused to enter. Instead, he retreated into the inches thick white lawn and stared with familiar pink eyes. Follow me, he purred into her head. How could she refuse such a lover? Leaving the house in her bedclothes, she waded into the there was no coldness out here either. No poor prince. That's odd, she thought, and checked behind her. But no, 
There was nothing back there either. No tread, no footprints in the snow. Just an old lady sleeping in the armchair, surrounded by cats, so very wrinkled, baggy at the seams. Meow, the white cat beckoned, and she turned back to him. When she turned back to him, she saw, to her surprise, there was nothing but brightness. Everything was white, the purest of colours. David had at last take her. I got all choked up. Oh. I, I really enjoyed <clears throat> that, that story when I read it. Oh. And, and I'm super soppy about all animals, especially <clears throat> cats. <'cause laughs> I, I, I didn't like the other one. Yeah, like, oh, no, no, I still like that. I was just a bit like, oh, my word. Um, so when you read the book, um, if you haven't already, easily made as a bit mm. of a shocking ending. Um, but um, <laughs> Snowy, I, I just thought it was so beautiful because when my cats in the past, I've done the same thing. I'm like, oh. they really like this person. And, you know, you they've got their own little characters, haven't they? And, and David has said that that was a lovely story. And Grace oh. said that it was beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate so, that. So um, one thing I just need to um, ask you that um, Lynn um, has popped up a few times. So sorry, Lynn, we haven't got to you yet. When you mentioned the exhibition, um, the one in Essex, whereabouts is it? It's at the Beecroft Gallery. Um, on on Victorian Vic Avenue. Avenue? Yeah, so it used to be the old library. It did. I used to work there. Did you? Yeah. Wow. I used to go and study for my A-levels. Yeah, upstairs. It's a massive building really and massive. it's a brilliant space. Um, yeah, like it a big is. auditorium in the like big yeah. massive area in the middle. Um, yeah. It was great to do events there actually. Yeah, yeah, it is good. I mean, it's a, it's a really great space. We had a women's festival there on March the 8th. Just we, we had the first ever women's march down the high street and then we had a festival there where we had DJs and showed films and Jack Monroe was the keynote speaker and debate. Oh, Jack's fabulous as well. Yeah, she's great. So she's been really supportive. So we'll probably do it again next March, I think. Fantastic, yeah. Post-vaccination, hopefully. That's it at the moment. Obviously, I mean, all of our online events, we've got quite a lot more coming up. I mean, yeah. it's Karen Swan next week and then we've got a load in the new year as well. Yeah. Um, and they're all online because we... Um, Obviously, we, we can't really do this in person at the moment, but yeah. Um, yeah. we find a way Next um, to still we'll make it, it happen. Um, you want I've, me to pick a number? Well, actually, what's happened is I've been messaging uh, Melissa, uh, my colleague, okay. someone randomly who is um, I'm watching the webinar right now, and I'm delighted to let Joanne, I apologise if I pronounce this incorrectly, Joanne, Algra Milan. Um, you have um, congratulations. The congratulations, Joanne. Congrats. Oh. Um, Joanne, would you be able to, on the chat, um, send an, a, a note to all panellists and give us your address so Sid can get that to you? Just yes. make sure you do it to all panellists. And Joanne, um, also, if you tell me, I mean, this is an exceptionally good Christmas present for someone. So if you want me to dedicate it to as a gift to someone, just tell me what to write, what the name is, and, and then I will post this to you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Sid. That's, that's amazing. Um, and Grace has just also said how much she loves the online events and it's not oh, easy to get brilliant. to physical events and and actually Grace I'd just like to say that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about doing this um, because my sister was disabled and also couldn't get out and when we bring this into your home it makes these things so much more accessible to everybody and, yeah. and I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think we I think we need to remember this in the future as well don't we as we move out of lockdown but it's always really important to continue streaming and to continue doing things online as well absolutely yeah. absolutely i mean suffolk libraries we're, we're as well as all for talks we're doing a lot for parents we've got online groups and we are absolutely committed to looking at bringing this forth as part of our offer from now on because we've just had an amazing response from our customers and um 
there's been several people popping up to say thank you and that they've really enjoyed it. So thank you all ever so much for coming. If um, Joanne, if you could just send your address to all panelists, um, if it doesn't come through, I will be able to contact you via the Zoom sign up for this evening's event. Oh, it's just pop through. That is fantastic. Thanks so much, Joanne. Um, so I will pass that on to Sid. And she's going to have it as a Christmas present to herself. Oh, lovely. I love that, Joanne. Yes. Good, good thing to do. <laughs> Absolutely. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, but yeah, lots of people um, saying um, that they've just really enjoyed this. So thank, thank you, you ever I so much. I hope I didn't ramble too much. No, you're always fabulous and a delight. You know that, Sid. You're, you're just thank amazing. You. And um, lots of people are saying, please keep doing online stuff, lots of thank yous coming through. Um, where is the exhibition if people want to go see it? Um, Mel, the exhibition is at the Beecroft Light. Um, Beecroft in South End, on, on Victoria Avenue. But it's probably going to be coming back um, next year. So really lovely everyone saying how much you've enjoyed this evening. So I really oh, appreciate that. Um, if Mel, my colleague, me. would be ever so kind as to make a note of Joanne's address, that would be fantastic. And we'll get that, um, Joanne, to Sid. And you'll get that book as a Christmas present to yourself. You'll fully enjoy it. And um, I'll, give her, I'll give her a packet of super scrubs as well if she wants some. Oh, look at that. See, this is why you're fabulous, Sid. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Take all blessings. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll sign that as well. Oh, you're a star. Thank you so much. And um, everyone's really enjoyed it. So thank you to our um, readers, to our customers that have come and supported us this evening, Suffolk Libraries. Thank you so much. We do this for you. And we're really thrilled when you come along and everyone enjoys it so much. So thank you very much. And of course, a massive thank you to you, Sid. Thank, thank you, you so much. Me. For, and for thank you for brilliant you. questions as well, Lisa. Really oh good. no, you're welcome. Yeah. I mean, it's it's because you've done so much fabulously interesting things. <laughs> I, could, I could have been talking to you for another hour quite easily, I think. And about I'll your do it next year. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Your days of traveling and your oh, uh, yeah. forming poetry. Oh, and yeah. this is how awesome Sid is. She's done all sorts. And um, it wasn't that awesome. But <laughs> it was fantastic. So thank you everyone so much. Um, I will, what I'll do, um, Mel, if you could let me know that you've got Joanne's address, that would be amazing. And then what I'll do is um, in a moment, she's got it. Awesome. Um, so Melissa works for Suffolk Libraries as well, and she's been in the background. So also huge thanks to Melissa for um, um, recording all this event for people to enjoy afterwards as well. So yeah. again, huge thanks, Sid. Thank you for coming this evening. Very, very kind of you to have me. Thank you. Brilliant. And I'm just going to end the event, which means everyone will um, disappear, including the lovely Sid. So thank you all very much. And Karen Swan next week, if you're free, come along. We have another talk. So bye, everyone. Bye.